Well, all right, let's take our Bibles tonight and let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. And we are going to look a little bit in 9, and then we're going to head into chapter 10 tonight as well. See, Laura made it back. All right. Well, tonight's going to be somewhat introductory because we're going to spend a few weeks, I think, um, in this 10th chapter looking at the covenant that the nation enters into here. And I want to I want to spend a little time, but we could just put it all into one message and, and just give an overview of it. But I want to break down some of the elements of this covenant uh, over the next few weeks because I think there's some... Uh, not only interesting truth for us concerning the nation of Israel and what they're going through here, but there is some ways in which we should be able to look at it and apply it to our own lives and ministry as well. So I don't want to rob us of that. But tonight, we're going to spend our message kind of looking at their attitude and their spirit, their willingness to enter into this covenant, perhaps what precipitated it, and what it means to enter into a covenant with God in these areas. And so to do that, we're going to be looking at uh, verse 38 of chapter 9 uh, through verse 29 of uh, chapter 10. Uh, please forgive me, there's, there's a listing here of several names. I'm not going to uh, desecrate these good people by abusing their names tonight. And in in, so we'll pass over that. And if you'll allow me to, and uh, we'll just read some of the other uh, verses that surround it when we get to that point. Maybe for a starting point tonight, let's just begin in verse 38 of chapter 9. We left off last week in 37, which you might have thought strange. Why didn't you move on? Well, because chapter 38 kind of makes this statement of what they're going to do and heads into chapter 10. I'm sure there were good reasons why they didn't include that in the beginning of chapter 10. But uh, at least for continuity's sake, we're going we're to include it with 10 tonight. So in chapter 9, verse 38, we read, And because of all this, and we'll go back and rehearse what all this was that we looked at last week, we, speaking of the people, make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. I mentioned this morning the title of this message tonight comes from Pilgrim's Progress. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment as well. But it was a statement in Pilgrim's Progress where a gentleman says, Set down my name, sir. In other words, put me in the ledger. I I'm committed to what is before me. And that's what I think the people are doing here uh, in the nation of Israel as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer ask his blessing. Father, I pray that you would help us tonight. In these moments that we have as we come to your word, Father, uh, guide us and instruct us. Teach us your truth. Lord, we've mentioned it often, but it's good for us to be reminded. These Old Testament narratives, these, these Old Testament truths, yes, sometimes they have prescriptive truths to teach us. But for the most part, much or at least the vast majority of our Old Testament is, is really given to us, I believe, in an example type uh, ministry and format. The Apostle Paul even stated that, that these things were written in the Old Testament for our admonition. The reason many of these events were recorded uh, was because people later on would need to read about these things and benefit from them. And obviously his stating that to a New Testament church means that there's a lot of benefit for, the, for us. We may not be Old Testament Israel. We may not be living in their circumstances and situations, but there is often application uh, between these dispensations and between these different groups of people. And I do pray tonight that somehow we might be able to see and find that as well, that as we understand what they were doing, we might allow your spirit to challenge our hearts and, and help us to see where we stand in these areas as well as our relationship and commitment to Christ. So, Father, we ask your blessing upon this time, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a lot of good Christian books that have been a blessing down throughout the ages. One of those has been uh, Pilgrim's Progress. And as I said, I've taken my title out of Pilgrim's Progress. It's an allegory written by John Bunyan, uh, who was in prison for his faith because of his preaching of the word and his stand for truth. And uh, he, was, he was sentenced, and, but didn't waste that time griping, complaining, and groveling. He actually used that as a time to grow in his relationship with God and to put together uh, these truths that have blessed many throughout the centuries. 
And in Pilgrim's Progress, many of you have read it. Uh, we showed a video that was uh, based upon it uh, not too long ago, and we've been selling those videos here recently. It's a story of the journey of a young man in Christian who is on his way from fleeing from the city of destruction because of the warning he's received of what is about to come for the sins of the people, and he's heading toward Mount Zion and the celestial city. And if you're reading through Pilgrim's Progress, not far along in his journey, he comes to a house, and it's described to us as the house of the interpreter. And the interpreter takes Christian into this house, and he opens various doors, which open up vignettes for Christian to look at and explore and try to understand and get a meaning of things that are all pointing to events that will happen in his future life. In this particular case, he's seeing things to give him a glimpse of how things will go along his journey on his way to the celestial city. And at a certain point, the interpreter shows Christian the scene. He describes it this way in, in the book. It says, I saw also that the interpreter took him by the hand and led him to a pleasant place where was built a stately palace, beautiful to behold, at the sight of which Christian was greatly delighted. He saw also on top of uh, upon the top there of certain persons walking who were clothed all in gold. And so interpreter shows Christian this scene and he's enamored by it, obviously, as we would be. And he, he asked the interpreter, he says, may we go in thither? All right. And that's where the book picks up. And I want to just read a couple of paragraphs of, of what transpires after he asked this question. The book goes on to say this, Then the interpreter took him and led him up toward the door of the palace, and behold, at the door stood a great company of men, as desirous to go in, but durst not. There also sat a man at a little distance from the door at a table side with a book and his inkhorn before him, to take the name of him that should enter therein. He saw also that in the doorway stood many men in armor to keep it, being resolved to do to the men that would enter what hurt and mischief they could. Now was Christian somewhat in amaze. At last, when every man started back for fear of the armed men, Christian saw a man of a very stout countenance come up to the man that sat there to, the right, sat there to write, saying, Set down my name, sir. The which, when he had done, he saw the man draw his sword, put a helmet upon his head, and rush toward the door upon the armed men, who laid upon him with deadly force. But the man, not at all discouraged, fell to cutting and hacking most fiercely. So after he had received and given many wounds to those that attempted to keep him out, and then uh, John Bunyan references Matthew eleven twelve, 12, where, where it speaks about those that would enter into the kingdom will enter in with much violence. He references Acts 14, 12, where the, the challenge is made that the Christians are only going to enter into their, uh, their eternal reward through much tribulation and persecution. So he says, so after he had received and given many wounds to those that attempted to keep him out, he cut his way through them all and pressed forward into the palace at which there was a pleasant voice heard from those that were there, wherein, uh, even of those that walked upon the top of the palace saying, come in, come in, eternal glory, thou shalt win. So he went in and was clothed with such garments as they. Then Christian smiled and said, I think verily I know the meaning of this. So in this scene, it's a vision, obviously, that Christian is receiving, a vision to give him a glimpse of what is awaiting him on his journey to the celestial city. He sees many of the perils. He sees many of the difficulties that are going to seek to hinder his entrance therein. And the point of the scene appears to be that this man was able to enter in, howbeit not without much difficulty and tribulation. And his ability to face the difficulties and to persevere in the midst of them was typified by his initial dedication, which was displayed when he went up to the man who at the table was taking the names of anybody who wished to enter in. And he says, put my name down there. Include me in this group because this is where I want to go and this is where I am headed. But in the scene that Bunyan paints for us here, Christian noticed that there were a lot of other people around the gate. There were a lot of people sitting outside of this city that desired to go in. They admired it. They wanted to be a part, but they wouldn't commit themselves. They were not apparently willing to go up to the man at the table and put their name down and then seek to enter in. They weren't willing to go through the battle that would be necessary for them to enter into the celestial city. Now, Bunyan doesn't give us the reasons why they were not ready to make this commitment. It could have been for a myriad of reasons. Maybe they didn't want to go forward because of a fear of suffering. If this is going to be painful, if this is going to be difficult, if this is going to cost me much that I hold dear, then maybe they didn't want to give up those things in order to win this celestial city. 
Maybe it was a fear of failing. Maybe they wanted it. They desired it. They would maybe even be willing to pursue it, but for the fact that they're fearful they won't be able to make it through. You know, I might start out, but what if I'm not able to get through? What if the enemies are too fierce? What if they drive me back? What if I'm not able to make it in? Then I'm worse off than when I began. Not only do I not get where I want to go, but I suffer all the hurt and the loss that there is there along the way. Maybe there was a lack of surety in their hearts and minds, whether it was really worth the effort or the sacrifice. And I think each of us has faced that. I, I, I will speak for me. I face that at times in my Christian experience. There's been times where I'm, I'm getting discouraged, I'm getting down, and it's kind of like I start wondering within my own heart, kind of like Asaph's psalm there in Psalm 73. Is it, is it really worth it? You look around at the prosperity of the wicked and all the things they seem to be enjoying, and it seems that they're sinning with impunity and nothing seems to be happening to them. And then Christians sometimes seem to be suffering and going through difficulty and loss, and you begin to wonder, is this really worth it? Is this life in Christ? Christ, what it's all supposed, what it's all cracked up to be? Will it in the end pay off for me if I go forward? And maybe they were having these thoughts as well and these, these uh, lack of, of a surety that it would be worth the effort and that drove them back. We don't know for sure what kept these others from stepping up to the table, caused them to not ask the man to put their name down in the book. But of all the people that were there, all the people that were looking to get in, as Christian stood there with the interpreter, he could only count one man who was willing to make the commitment, and he only saw one man who was able to make it into the celestial city. Now, perhaps this has always been a problem with fallen humanity, and I'm sure it has been. There's no new generation under their sun. There's no new sin under the sun either. I mean, we are all sinners in that sense, but it does seem as if in our present generation, there is a, a, a real difficulty to make commitments to so many things in our lives. And maybe, maybe we notice it, people of, of generations even before mine and my own generation, having been raised in the United States for the majority of our lives, where it has been a nation that's had at least a Christian ethic and a Christian mindset by and large. And even though people weren't necessarily saved, they operated under a Christian mindset. And so there were many things that went along with that, perhaps. But as we become further and further removed from that element in our nation, we see people's hearts turning more and more. And this idea of commitment really seems to be going out the window. There's various areas in our lives in which we're called upon to make commitments. One of them is marriage. And it seems to have gone out of vogue in our day and age. The concept of committing oneself to another individual for life <laughs> seems to be something that many young people aren't willing to do. There's some, it seems like when you talk to them, it's, it's what they have as a dream at some point in the future, <laughs> but it's not something they're willing to make a commitment to now. Oh, wait a minute, you know, there's too much life to live before I go and make such a commitment as that. I remember talking to a young man in my previous church, and we talked about various things, and it was just, you know, we were having a conversation one day. We were just out doing something general. We were just talking about various things, and he just kind of out of the blue, we were, he made this comment. He says, well, he says, I know what marriage is going to require of me. There's a whole lot of living I want to do before I do that. And he wasn't talking necessarily about sinful things, you know, you know, going out and carousing with other women and all these kind of things. To my knowledge, he wasn't doing any of those types of things. He just, he was a free, wheeling, free loving guy. He wanted to experience all that life was there. He knew if he made a commitment to a woman, it was going to tie him down. It was going to limit his abilities in other areas. It seems like we see that, you know, we, the, the, the age of, of young people entering into marriage covenants today seems to be getting later and later and later and later. Some of that, you wonder why. What's the, what's the problem here? And many today, unfortunately, that do agree to marry, for whatever reason, seem to have uh, in their mind this idea, well, if it doesn't work out, we'll just back away from it and we'll get a divorce and move on and we won't really be obligated to one another for any length of period of time. In our day and age, we see contracts. They are still written. But who really signs a contract in our day and age with an expectation that they're actually going to fulfill it to the end? What employer signs an employee to a contract today actually expecting to fulfill the terms of that contract to the end? And what employee today signs on with an employer really expecting to live out the agreement of that contract until its conclusion? You know, the days and age, my father, when he got out of the Air Force, took a job with IBM and worked it for 35 or 40 years till he, till he retired. It seems like those days are gone. They're both gone on the worker's side. Nobody has that expectation anymore. And they seem to be gone on the business's side. No businesses have any attempt or desire to hire a worker and pay them and take care of them for a length of time that they could keep them till the time that they retire. That idea of this contract seems to be going away in our day and age. In the area of Christianity and the church, 
How many Christians actually know that their church actually has a document that's called a church covenant? And how many of them have ever read it? How many churches actually draw attention to their church covenants and ask their membership to read, understand, and agree to them? And then let's go a step further. How many church members actually take the covenant seriously that they have read, if they have read it, and seek to live up to it when the, when the things go rough and things aren't going exactly the way that they envisioned? Commitment, I'm sure, always has been a problem. But in our day and age, it seems to be a, a real problem, even for Christians at times, to enter into these types of covenant agreements, to have this type of attitude in their lives. But I guess the question we ought to ask ourselves is this, should it be? Should it be that hard for us to make these types of commitments? As we look at our text today, we're going to see, as I said, the nation being willing to enter into a covenant agreement, okay? Okay. And in order to understand it and get the full picture for us, we do need to keep it anchored to all the other things that have been going on in this particular story. There is a danger, I think, when you read a book like Nehemiah to just look at a passage like ours today and see what's happening here without really reminding ourselves of all the things that preceded it. And we think back about stuff we talked about the last few weeks. We remember that the people had gathered together in Jerusalem, all right, and they had gathered there to celebrate the last three festivals of their Jewish religious calendar. That was the Feast of the, the Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. During this time, they had asked Ezra to read unto them the law of God and to give them the understanding. We looked at that a couple weeks ago, and Ezra did. He stood up on the pulpit they constructed for the purpose. He began to read the word of God, and then the, the scribes and, and the others came along and, and began to give the people the understanding in the sense thereof. And we said it could be that they were just being interpreters. Maybe Ezra was reading it in the Hebrew tongue, and not many of them being living in Persia most of their lives spoke Hebrew anymore, and he had to translate it into the Aramaic or some other language they were speaking so they could understand it. That's certainly possible. may have been a part of what was going on. I think it's also highly probable that what they were doing was going among the people, helping them understand what the law was actually saying, what its expectations really were, what God really wanted them to be and do as his people. Remember, they've been living in their Persian captivity. They've lost sight of a lot of these things, and they needed to be reminded of what God's specific expectations were for them as a people. Ezra read it, we saw, from morning to midday on the first day. Then the elders gathered on the second day to give further consideration to what the law had taught. And they found out that the nation had not been accurately obeying God's commandments with relation to the Feast of Tabernacles. They had apparently been gathering at various times, going through some of the elements of the Feast of Tabernacles, but specifically the one thing that the law had commanded them to do, which was to construct these booths and live in them for this week-long period, the nation had not been doing it. So then... For they go out in obedience to the law, and they construct these booths, and for the next seven days of the feast, they live in these booths. But at the same time, we were instructed that the word was read into them each and every day. And at the conclusion of the feast days, the nation remained in Jerusalem, and as we looked at last week, they were in sackcloth and they were in ashes. And they began to confess their sins and their iniquities, and they once began and began to listen to the word of God as it was read unto them. No matter what we think of the truths we will discuss in our message today, they cannot be separated from these events. We must understand the impact that God's law, the impact that God's word was having upon these people as they heard it read, as they understood what God's expectations were, and they began to examine their lives in light of it and realized how far from living up to God's expectations they were. That is the importance of God's word. You know, when you think about some of the things that Bible tells us about the Word of God itself, realize this, that God's Word is life. So many passages in the Scripture remind us that it is the Word of God that, that gives us life, that keeps us alive, that is able to sustain our life. Jesus, in His high priestly prayer, prayed and reminded the Father and begged Him. He said, Father, sanctify, set your people apart through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. In light, kind of light of what we were talking about in our introduction to Romans this morning, and I was challenging us to say, do we realize what we have before us? Do we realize what God could do in our lives and in our church through just the study of this book? We need to realize that it is God's word that is life. It is God's word that will sanctify us. None of us are going to be what God expects us to be unless God transforms us through his word. But we have to be in the word, and we have to not only just be reading it, but understanding it and desiring what it, does, it commands us to do to be a reality in our lives. Never underestimate the word. God's word is powerful. I've said often, anytime in the scriptures you read God speaking, things happen. 
And when God has spoken in his word, if we are to take God's word and allow it to have its way in our lives, it will change us as well. That being the case, though, I would also remind us of this. Never underestimate the enemy's desire to keep us from the word. Why is it so hard for us sometimes to just set aside quality time to spend in the word? Why is it sometimes such a struggle? Why is it that when we go to sit down and spend time in the Word, everything seems to go wrong? Everything clamors for our attention. Everything would drive us away from that sacred and holy duty. Why is that? Well, at least one of the reasons may be because we have a real enemy. And he understands the value of the Word as well. And if he can keep us away from the Word, he knows that he is going to go a long way in keeping us from fulfilling God's expectations for our lives. So don't underestimate the power of the Word. Don't underestimate the enemy's hatred of the Word and his desire to keep us from it. So they enter into this covenant, and we see, I think, stated in verse 38 of chapter 9. It says, Because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. So the nation decides to pledge themselves in covenant. And the word covenant has been supplied by our English translators. It isn't actually part of the the Hebrew text, but it's surely what is implied here in this statement. The word sure that is in our text is the word manah. It is a binding agreement. It is something that is written out, and it is something that then when people take it and read it and agree to it, it would be sealed. And that's what's talked about here. The the, um, Levites and the priests will seal unto it. The seal was something that signified the the settledness of this, that people do understand it. They have committed themselves to it. And many times, at least in the area of the realm, the king's signet ring would be pressed into the wax, sealing it and saying, this is a settled matter. All right. It has my my seal upon it. And in this sense, the, the ruling leaders, religious leaders have sealed the people's desire to enter into a covenant with God. A covenant is a pledge. It is an agreement that locks the participants into really what becomes a legally binding contract. There's a reason why we call it a marriage covenant. When two people make this choice to to marry one another, they are entering into a covenant, into a contract of sorts. And at least in Western culture, we have two people who have individually, voluntarily decided to bind themselves one to another, to afford one another certain privileges and responsibilities and with the desired expectation that they will receive it from the other. Anybody who's been married in a Christian setting and has gone through a Christian marriage ceremony knows this, that when they enter into this covenant and they make their vows, they are going to say what? Till death, do us part. This is a commitment that we are making that we will honor for the rest of our lives, save God himself severs it. And although we know that even the Bible itself seems to give us some areas in which these covenants can be annulled, Jesus seems to indicate that when one party has been unfaithful and they've committed adultery, and in a sense that in itself, that act severs that one flesh union that this couple had together, even in that, and the scriptures are clear, it is not a mandate that that marriage needs to be dissolved. In fact, love can actually overcome and conquer that and enable that marriage to remain whole and together even when one has been unfaithful for a period of time. The nation here enters into a covenant. And I would like to take a remainder of this message and analyze three aspects of this covenant that the nation is entering into. The first thing I think we see is what could be called the desire of the covenant. And again, in verse 38 of chapter 9, and because of all this... We make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. It's interesting that the the people say, because of all this, we're going to make this sure covenant. What does all this refer to here? Well, certainly the, the, the phrase would have to allude to all that's transpired before this. It certainly would be referring to the events of the past 10 days, all that the nation has been going through, certainly the time of reviving, The truth of God's word that was brought into their lives and and made them aware of God's expectations, all of the all of the, you know, the confession and all these types of things, this is going to be part of this. But I think specifically it is this confessional prayer that is considered in this all this. If you think back to all that the nation has just confessed, and if you weren't with us last week, we're not going to go back and read them again. But as the nation begins to confess their sins before the Father, their penitential prayer, the people's hearts were actually, at least by their words, had been drawn back to God's covenant faithfulness with them. As they had heard the law read to them by Ezra, they had been reminded of God's choosing of Abraham. 
that that God had himself made Abraham a promise, a covenant that he would make a great nation out of him, their nation. And the covenant God had willingly chosen to enter to with Abraham and his seed was a covenant God had made with them. They had recounted how they as a nation had so often rebelled against God, how they had many times and their forefathers had refused to serve God, and yet they recounted in their confessional prayer how God had been faithful to them. God had never reneged on his covenant promises to them. He had not rejected them in spite of their sins. They had recounted that even their struggles as a nation, even their being enslaved as they presently were to the Persian government and ruled over by nations outside of of themselves, was really God's faithfulness to them. His efforts had been to use these nations to help his people see the errors of their ways and to turn their hearts back to them. And they had recounted that every time they as a nation confessed their sins and every time they turned back to God, crying out to him that in mercy, God always was quick to forgive their sins, hear their cries and forget their sins. And in order, in other words, when they say because of all this, I think they are referring to God's covenantal faithfulness that he has shown over the years to their forefathers and now unto them. And this seems to be the basis now of their newfound desire to say we will now enter into a covenant with our God. You know, John in his epistle in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, makes this statement. He says, we, speaking of Christians, we love him. We love God because he first loved us. He actually preceded that with these words in the same epistle where he said, here in his love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And that he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. In other words, why do we love God? Why do we want to serve him? Why do we want to do these things for God? Well, it's because he first loved us. <laughs> It is a reciprocation of what he's already manifested in our lives. Or we could look at it this way. No one enters into a covenant without some motivating factor or force. And there can be no greater factor that can motivate us than love and gratitude. An employee does not enter into a contract with his employer unless he believes that employer has the ability to honor this and meet his needs, and that's why he's doing this. Vice versa, no employer is going to hide an employee unless he believes this person is going to live up to their contract expectations and deliver the services that they are agreeing to. Same thing in a marriage, a man or a woman. They enter into this covenant binding agreement with the other person because they believe, hey, not only do do I want to serve this person because I love them, but I actually believe this person loves me and is going to return this in kind to me. Same thing in a church covenant situation. Members enter into covenant with a church because they desire to serve the Lord in this community, to use the spiritual gifts that God has given them to honor God and to better that community of believers. But at the same time, they have the right to expect that that church family is going to reciprocate it in their lives as well, that they are going to minister to them, that they are going to love them, that they are going to keep them included, that they are going to be a blessing to them. This is that mutual element of a covenant. So no one enters into a covenant without some motivating factor. And love and gratitude can be the greatest motivating factors. Israel was entering into covenant because of God's covenant faithfulness, his said, his ongoing mercy that he had displayed to them as a nation. And in the Christian sense, we will not enter into a covenant with God unless we have a deep abiding love for him. And we're not going to truly have a deep abiding love for God until we first understand the depths and the greatness of God's love toward us. And what is the greatness of that love? Well, the Bible tells us God commendeth his love toward us And then while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Dear friend, the reason why you would ever choose to serve God is because the wicked, vile sinner that you are, the God of heaven loved you. And he demonstrated that it wasn't some warm, fuzzy feeling he had towards you. He demonstrated that love when he left the glories of heaven, took on a robe of human flesh, walked among sinful men, where he received all the despisement and the shame that could, be all, that could be heaped upon him, even what man could do in hanging him on a cross and seeking to take his life from him. But more than that, he was willing to receive the brunt of all of God's righteous judgment upon our sins as he hung there upon the cross. If God's love is not manifested in Jesus Christ, then how could it ever be manifested? But when we come to understand what God has done for us and we received it in a personal way in our own lives, well, then we have a supreme basis to enter into this kind of covenant agreement with him as well. I think we also begin to see unfolding here, and we'll, we'll, it'll take the next few weeks to get into the depths of it, but we begin to see the, what I might call the direction of the covenant. In chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now these that sealed 
were Nehemiah, the Tirshath, the son of Hakaliah, and Zedekiah. And then he goes on and gives all these names. We're not going to read them. I apologize, but uh, it would be of no benefit tonight because I couldn't even pronounce their names right. But if we pick up in verse 28, it says, And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanims, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands under the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding, they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his judgments and his statutes. I know the sentence doesn't end there, but again, we're going to get into the particulars next week as we move forward. When one enters into a covenant, there has to be, in a sense, a direction for that covenant, an object, if you will, unto which this covenant is being entered. And as you look at the statement that the nation makes here, the words of the people in the text, it appears that there are at least three areas in which this covenant is directed, or there are three reasons why they are entering into this covenant. We see they make a statement here that they are entering in a covenant with the Lord, our Lord. It's there at the very end of verse 29, where it says, To walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, a servant of God, and to observe all and do all the commands of the Lord, our Lord. It is also directed toward the keeping of his laws and his commandments. He says to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord. And then he also make mention of that they are going to, in the process of this, be cleaving to their brethren and nobles. That comes out in the beginning of verse 29. They clave to their brethren and their nobles and entered into this curse. We'll hopefully be able to develop this more next week as we begin looking at the specifics of the covenant. But suffice it to say for tonight, this covenant was based really upon three things. The first thing was this. The nation was entering into a covenant because of who God is. He is the Lord. In that sense, we can all understand that, I guess, or we should be able to. That's really, if man is unwilling to acknowledge it, that is the essence of his sin. Not willing to acknowledge that God is the Lord. He's the supreme one. He is the master of all of the universe. But the interesting thing is the way they describe God. He is the Lord, our Lord. That personal relationship that the nation has with God, or maybe we could look at it this way, the personal relationship that this God of creation had been willing to have with this people. I think we could be honest tonight and say this. People do not enter into covenants with individuals with whom they do not deem them worthy. Even in a strictly secular sense, you will not enter into a contract or a covenant with someone, perhaps like an employer, unless you deem them to be people who are capable and reliable enough to provide you with the things you are seeking by entering into this contract or covenant with them. Israel was entering into a covenant with their God, and the reason they were willing to do it was because they knew that Yahweh was their God. He was the Lord, their Lord. And when you stop again and think about this, and I, I, I try to drive this home to us often because I think it's something we sometimes forget. When we think about God, or even we think about our relationship to God through Jesus Christ, we need to realize that we are His people. I know sometimes when you, when you make statements like this, people look at it the wrong way and make it seem like you're saying, well, nobody else could ever be a part of this exclusive group. That's not what I'm talking about. We do need to understand this. If we are part of the church of Jesus Christ, then we're a part of a unique group of people. John in his epistle said, year of God and the whole rest of the world lies in wickedness. In other words, when in, the, when in the scriptures, you can read the scriptures from the very beginning, even with the first two sons of Adam and Eve, you've got Cain and you've got Abel. Cain is described as the wicked one, according to John in his epistle. Abel was the one who's listed in the heroes of faith. You have this de demarcation of humanity. You have people of God and you have people who are not of God. And all through history, you have these two lines. You have people, you're either part of God's family or you're not part of God's family. Now, I'm not by saying that, saying there's no possibility, praise God, for you have been over here outside of God's family and by grace through faith come into God's family. I'm not implying that at all. But those who find themselves over here, if by the grace of God and your faith in Jesus Christ, you find yourself part of the family of God, you need to realize the unique and privileged position you're in. You have a relationship with the God of creation. His wrath is no longer abiding upon you. He's welcomed you into his arms as his covenant children. 
He calls you son or daughter. We are able to call him daddy. We have that kind of unique, intimate relationship with him. This is our relationship to God. And when the nation of Israel began to recount their history as the law was read to them, and they began to see what God had been willing to do for them as a nation, how God had come and tabernacled among them as a nation, how he had given them his laws, and even when their forefathers failed to follow those laws, how God was continued to remain steadfast and merciful and forgiving when they would repent of their sins and continue to work through all of their lives to fulfill his covenant promises to them. They acknowledge, we want to enter into a covenant with the Lord, our Lord. And when we think about committing our lives to God, we need to realize this. He's our God. It is not some vast, far-removed, individual that we can have no concept of a personal intimate relationship with? No. Through Jesus Christ, we are now one with him. As Peter said, we are partakers of the divine nature. This is our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Do we understand it? That's kind of where I'm headed on Sunday mornings in our, in our study into Romans. It's like, do we understand what the gospel is teaching us here? What all is true of us as God's people? And as the nation was reminded of this through the reading of the law, they said, we want to enter into a covenant with God, the Lord, our Lord. Secondly, they were covenanting to uphold God's laws and his commandments. Again, he says that in verse 29. They claimed to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, a servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his judgments and his statutes. Once again, because of who God is, the nation understands he's worthy of our obedience. They come to understand that his laws are righteous and just. They come to understand that his ways and the pathway he has outlined for them as his people are beyond reproach. You keep your finger, I've been quoting John's epistle a lot, but it just kind of seems to really relate to this. And turn to 1 John and look at something he says as he draws to the end of his epistle in 1 John chapter 5. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, we read this. John says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments, John says, are not grievous. Isn't it interesting? In our lost estate... It is the commandments and the commands of God that we find grievous, right? I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. You have no right to tell me how I need to live my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to be God. I'm going to rule. I'm going to reign. I'm going to sit on the throne. I'll be like the Most High. I'll be the one that calls the shots here. All of God's commands are grievous when we're at enmity with him. But when by God's grace we are, we are brought to an awareness of our sin and we are broken over our sins as only God can do in our lives and we repent of our sins, we turn from that wicked, rebellious way and we put our faith in Christ, we cleave to him as our only hope of eternal salvation. And when by God's grace we are cleansed and we are declared righteous in Christ and even his righteousness, his righteous ways are imputed unto us and not only that, imparted into our lives, his very nature takes over in our lives, his Holy Spirit comes to reign within our our bodies. Everything changes. Now these things that we hated and rebelled against become things that really in our heart of hearts we desire. And when we fail in them, because sometimes we do give into the old sinful ways of the flesh, immediately when that happens, what are we? Convicted? <laughs> Broken? Saddened by that we have once again failed to live up to God's expectations because we know God's expectations are righteous and pure and good. That they've only been given, been given to us for our own benefit. That they are a declaration and a sign that God actually loves us. When the nation saw this, when they understood who they were dealing with, they had a desire and they covenanted to uphold God's laws and his commandments because they were worth keeping. And thirdly, they were willing to enter into this covenant as a group of people. We could say it as a one another group of God's people. At the beginning of verse 29, back in Nehemiah chapter 10, it says this, and they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law. So there is this 
sense of community, if you will, that comes out in this covenant. While in one way they were personally related to Yahweh, they actually were related to him by their inclusion within this nation, which was God's nation. Therefore, while some aspects of the covenant had to be lived out in an individualistic way, they really were being lived out in conjunction with all of God's people. And certainly much of the law that they had received from God was aimed at their relationship as the people of God. You know, the latter portion of the Ten Commandments is what? Basically a fulfillment of loving your neighbor as yourself. And as you look at many of the laws, even some of the ceremonial and the civil laws that God handed down to this nation, it was all aimed at keeping these people tightly knit to one another and meeting the needs of their community, but also keeping them segregated and separated from the people outside here that were not part of God's community. It was really a community-based element, and when they think about entering this covenant, they aren't just a bunch of individuals standing there saying, hey, I'm going to do this, but they actually are as a nation cleaving to one another, entering into this in a nationalistic sense. The very covenant that was binding them to God was also indissolubly binding them to one another. I think they understood something that we as Christians sometimes, I think, are struggling to understand. You cannot be rightly related to God without being rightly related to his people. No wonder G Peter or Paul, speaking of the Lord's Supper and, and partaking of those wonderful elements, talks about how God in his judgment was bringing sickness and even death to the church at Corinth because they were not rightly understanding the body of Christ. And yes, in one sense, maybe that meant they weren't looking at the elements as they represented the very physical body, the bread, his body, and the blood, you know, the juice, his blood. But contextually, it almost seems certain that Paul's main emphasis there was they weren't discerning the body that they were a part of, the church that they were a part of. And we had the haves and the have-nots. We had people over here feasting while other people over here starving, and nobody seemed to care. They weren't even thinking about the fact that God had saved them as a group of people, that they were all the bride of Christ, that they were gathered together and unified as God's church, and they had a responsibility one to another. And they really couldn't be rightly related to God unless they came to him through the right way, which was being rightly related to his people. And so as they entered into this covenant, they said, we're not just making a covenant with God, we're making a covenant with one another to serve God effectively as his people. And then lastly, quickly, we see their understanding of the demands of the covenant. Back in chapter 9, verse 38, they asked the princes and the Levites and the priests to seal this. In other words, we're making this covenant now. We want you to seal it. We want you to necessarily put the stamp to, to close it. This can't be altered. This can't be changed. This is what we're committing to do. And then in chapter 10, verse 29, again, it says, And they, they uh, claimed to their brethren and their nobles and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law. I think we could say this. What good is a covenant if it's not binding? How committed to a covenant will one be if there is not a significant price to be paid for failing to keep that covenant? You know, the nation actually wrote out their covenant and then they had their spiritual leaders seal it as a testimony to the nation's commitment to keep it. Beyond this, the nation entered into an oath and they placed a curse upon themselves if they failed to honor their covenantal word. The passage doesn't tell us what the curse would entail, but a curse is certainly a curse. The price, the, the, the placing of the entire nation under the obligation of holding this covenant, and if they did not, they were saying, God, give us what we need. Send your judgment upon us if we fail to uphold our word, if we fail to do what we are pledging to do today. I was mentioning this uh, to Bruce at the door this morning. Is it not true that most of our promises that we like to make are, we like to make them in private? <laughs> and why is it that we like to make them in private? Because if we don't uphold them, then nobody knows. I was trying to tell him this morning, I said, one of the reasons I kind of made the statement in the pulpit this morning, I need to get back to memorizing Romans, was because I know how easy it is for me when it gets hard to kind of back away and say, uh, I just won't fulfill that obligation. Well, now the church knows that I said I was going to do it. So at least that puts a little added pressure on me to keep with it when those things need to be done. But most of the time, if I make a promise, I want to keep it private because then if I fail, nobody knows. And is it not true that most of us try to stay away from any contract or agreement that has harsh penalties? I mean, we're looking for those things that, you know, can I, can I get out of this at some point and not have to suffer any consequences? That's what we're looking for. And that, all of our contracts, we're trying to write them in that way if, it, if it's all possible, because nobody wants to suffer the consequences. 
Because all of us, unfortunately, enter into covenants and contracts not really committed. <laughs> Believing we're probably going to turn away from this, and we don't want to have to suffer anything horrible or bad if we do. But at this point in the nation's experience, they are so convinced of their need to live unto God and, his, and to have His commandments as their life, that they are willing to publicly record their promise, and they are willing to place themselves under a curse, under a penalty before God, if they fail to commit and keep their covenant word. The demands of the covenant were strict, and the penalty for failing was severe, yet the desire of the people's hearts was to pledge themselves to their God. How about us tonight? Does the thought of entering into any type of binding covenant with God and His people seem foolish or extreme? I brought this up at various times when we were talking about the church, but it really is. In, in today's day and age, I don't know how many people I've talked to who either go to churches or men who oversee churches, they don't even practice church membership anymore. There's no such thing as a church membership. Nobody comes and signs on the dotted line. Nobody makes a commitment and says, I'm actually committing myself to this body and I'm putting my name on the roll and I will now uphold certain responsibilities and the congregation has the right to expect it. Now people just come and go as they please with no repercussions. Because of that idea that there, this commitment, we don't want to be tied down. We don't want to have to make a decision now that we're going to have to live with for the rest of our lives. But the reality is there are certain things that I think even God would say, yes, this is something you should be able to make a decision about now and be convinced that you will fulfill it for the rest of their lives. Any decision we make for God and our decision to obey and uphold his laws and his purposes should be binding. There should be no out. We should never feel that there could come a day when it would be possibly okay for me to not do what God expects me to do today. That I'm not only going to do that, but I'm before God and man saying I'm going to do that. And God hold me accountable if I don't. Because more than anything, I want to honor you and obey you with my life. Are we in our present day and age looking for the benefits of Christianity without the commitment? Are we like many of the people that are depicted in Pilgrim's Progress that Christians saw standing outside of the city, desiring to go in, but unwilling to have their name added to the list? Maybe out of fear of suffering, fear of failing, lack of surety as to whether it was really worth the effort of the sacrifice, but unwilling to make the commitment? Or are we like the one man that Christians saw of a stout continence who came to the table and said, set down my name, sir. I want to get there, and I'm going to put my name down, and I'm going to go get there, because that's what I want in my life. Next week, we're going to begin looking at the particulars of this covenant, Lord willing, and what it implies but suffice it to say for us tonight, we need to be willing to commit ourselves in this covenant promise and relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Are we committed to Christ regardless of the cost? Have we, in essence, said, put my name in the book? I don't even know all that entails right now, but put my name there. <laughs> you know, when, when people came and Jesus was ministering and they were considering becoming one of his disciples. Jesus is quick to say, hey, have you counted the cost? Do you know what you're signing up for? Because it isn't going to be easy roadway. It's going to be difficult. You need to understand it going forward. But always is worth it. Is there anybody that chose to follow Christ that later regretted it? But we have to make that commitment. We have to be willing to stand to it. And he expects us to be willing to make it on this side and make that commitment through faith. Are we, willing, are we willing to have our names set down in the book? Father, tonight I pray you challenge us with these thoughts. Lord, we're encouraged by the nation. This group of people, Lord, as they came into contact with your word, Lord, it's just really been sweet and pleasant to see their response to it. We see their conviction of sin. They're mourning and weeping, and yet then the elders come and say, oh, no, no, you can't mourn and weep today because this is supposed to be a day of feasting. It would be uh, disobedient to God to do this. So they go to their homes and feast as they're supposed to. But the next day, they're right back where they were, and they're hearing the word of God, and they're understanding the importance of being obedient, and they even take steps to obey things that they had not, like building booths and living in them for a week. And as they come more and more into contact with God's word, they begin to 
mourn over their sin and they break out sackcloth and ashes and they confess their sins before you, Father. And when they've come clean finally, and their relationship with you is where it needs to be at that particular point, then we see them tonight being willing to enter into this covenant. We haven't looked at the particulars of the covenant yet. We'll look at that in the coming weeks, Lord, if you allow us that opportunity. But for tonight, we at least see their spirit, their attitude. And Father, I do think that for us as Christians living today, our circumstances are different, but yet in many ways they're the same. And your expectation for us, I think, would be the same. You're asking us as your people to be willing to commit ourselves to you regardless of the cost. And Father, tonight I pray by your grace that we would see that it's worth making that type of commitment. And that we would have the boldness to enter into such a covenant before you. And not just a private thing that we do on our own where we could slip away from it and nobody else would know. But even in this case, a public commitment. A willingness to be counted in the register as one of the disciples of Christ. And Father, as we do that, then we pray by your grace that you would enable us to fulfill those covenant expectations and obligations so that we could truly serve you and honor you as you deserve to be served and honored. Lord, I don't know how you might want to use this in any of our individual lives tonight or in our church corporately, but I pray you would have it your way. And Lord, use it to continue to further your purposes among us. We thank you and we praise you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.